Hello, I'm John Gatto, and I travel by the name John Taylor Gatto for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Uh, I was a New York City public school teacher for 30 years, and I resigned from school teaching on the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal in 1991. And since that time, I've traveled one and a half million miles in all 50 states and eight foreign countries trying to arrest the career of the institution of government schooling. One of the really useful pieces of research that I've engaged in for the past 11 or 12 years is studying the 18 or 20 elite private boarding schools that set the tone for approximately 300 such schools and produce a substantial chunk of our national leadership. I don't think there are many people aware of the fact that in the 2000 presidential election, that four of the six finalists for the presidency went to one or another of these schools. George Bush went to Andover. Uh, John McCain went to Episcopal High. Steve Forbes went to Brooke. And Al Gore, I think Gore went to St. Andrews. But if you let me look at my note, uh, St. Albans in Washington, D.C. Uh, these schools only graduate about a 1,000 kids a year. This is a nation of 300 million, and yet four of the six finalists for the presidency attended schools that only graduate a thousand a year. So I thought there might be some real utility in finding out what these schools teach as opposed to what public schools teach. And that job proved to be much easier than I thought. So I'd like to share with you the 14 principles that I discovered that are universal among these schools. Even though each is quite a different animal than the next, they all concentrate on these 14 themes. The first of these themes is that no could, kid should graduate without a theory of human nature. What makes people tick? What buttons do you press to get the results from your fellow man and woman that you want? And where does the fund of lore come from? Not from psychology, not even in a small way. The fund of lore about human nature comes from history, philosophy, theology, that's a curse word, isn't it, in public schooling, literature, and law. These five mighty agencies of human history and the human mind have a wealth of information about what human beings are like now, have been like, and probably always will be like. And every kid is expected to have a degree of expertise drawn from these sources. I guess I should say these databases. The second requirement of these schools is that every graduate have a strong experience with the act of literacies. Now, we're all familiar with literacy as some exercise in reading, but the act of literacies are writing and public speaking. No matter how well developed your mind becomes on strong texts, it's useless to convince anyone else of your point of view unless you can write well and you can speak well. I think we've come to this juncture in history believing that that's some 
God-given gift that only a few people have, I can guarantee you, as a school teacher for 30 years, that both of those skills are extremely easy to teach. To teach public speaking, you simply have to offer regular opportunities to speak before a group of strangers. That could be a group as small as one, two, or three, or it could be an auditorium full of strangers. But the fact that they're not people that you feel comfortable with, I think is essential. To write well, it requires nothing more than that you write constantly and regularly, every day, preferably. The improvement will occur quite naturally. At that point, you might be able to profitably use some expert intervention, but in the process of reaching competency, intervention is the worst possible thing, simply the practice of doing it. So now we have a theory of human nature and skill in the act of literacies. Number three uh, among the curriculum themes that unite these elite private boarding schools is insight into the major institutional forms like our courts or our corporations or our military, including details of the ideas which drive them. I want to give you one sample of this so you can see how how seriously uh, government schools fall short of the mark in offering insight into these institutions. Uh, we have all heard endlessly in schools of separation of powers, that the governance of the United States is divided into at least three compartments, one an executive compartment, one a legislative compartment, that further divided into two compartments of its own, and finally a judicial department. Now, a little bit of reflection should show you what the purpose of that is. Not that we all live in harmony and agree in times of trouble with what to say and do, but exactly the opposite of that. That the only possible way to arrive at an approximation of truth is through argument. The more skillful the argument on all sides, the better for the, the ultimate result of truth. So that people who appear before you in the media and say, in this time of trouble, dissent is not wanted, are truly un-American because this country was the world's first laboratory of dissent on the part of everybody. That's really what the American dream is largely composed of, the ability to speak your mind in a public forum. So that kind of understanding, which is, is kept under close wraps in public schooling, is examined minutely in these elite private boarding schools. There are many, many other uh, working engines of our institutions that we're not allowed to understand. I might contradict myself and give you one more. The military, which is quite an expensive institution to maintain, even in times of peace, is always constituted at the fraction of one to one and a half percent of the entire adult male population. Never heard that before. That was a rule or a principle worked out in Prussian Germany several hundred years ago. Now your homework is to find out 
why that fraction, but I'll give you a clue. The prison population of the United States is very close to the military population of the United States, and that fraction, too, was worked out in Prussian Germany about 200 years ago. So you should expect the teachers that impact on your kids to be aware of these things and hundreds more like them and to make that the meat of their their contact with kids. And if you're homeschooling, do your homework. And that's not meant to be sarcastic. You'll grow each time you add one of these concepts to your own mental base. The fourth thing that private schools do, or elite private boarding schools do, that public schools hardly touch are the repeated exercises in the forms of good manners and politeness based on the utter truth that politeness and civility is the foundation of all future relationships, all future alliances, access to places that you might want to go there. Now, don't tell me, well, that's just common sense, because any public school I've ever been in, and I've been in hundreds, is a laboratory of rudeness, cruelty, sloppiness, coarseness. The fifth thing that private boarding schools emphasize is independent work. Think again about the possible reasons for that. In public schools as we know them, the teacher is charged with about 80 to 90 percent of the of filling the time uh, available one way or another and all the choices of the teachers. But in independent private boarding education, that ratio ideally is reversed. It probably never is completely reversed. But the weighting is shockingly different. The kids do most of the work. They're expected to do most of the work. They're expected to be resourceful enough to use the work of other kids also, not in public school. The sixth principle is that energetic physical sports aren't a luxury or a way to blow off steam, but they're absolutely the only way to confer grace on the human presence. And that that grace translates into power, into money later on. Uh, I was talking to David yesterday about the perception of George Washington as a very average mind among his own contemporaries, but nobody said that his physical presence was average. Washington in his diaries tells us that the two most important things that made him George Washington were deliberately selected. One was horseback riding and the other was ballroom dancing because it, it conferred a commanding physical presence on the person who could. Also, sports teach you practice in handling pain, in dealing with emergencies which occur regularly in sports. The seventh curricular theme in elite private boarding schools is a complete theory of access to any workplace or any person. You'd do better off than reading a civics textbook to set the kid, set a kid the challenge of getting a private meeting with the mayor of Los Angeles and let him work for a year on constructing 
an access to the mayor. Does that sound fanciful to you? My kids from a very ordinary New York public school got access not only to New York City's mayor, but to New York State's governor and CEOs beyond count. You can do that too. Teach your kid how to access places and people that he or she wants or needs. Number eight is responsibility as an utterly essential part of the curriculum. Now, yes, that includes things like washing dishes, but in elite private boarding schools, you ask a kid to care for a horse, to take some important community service, to go for leadership in clubs, much easier to get than you think because if the club is actually doing anything, it's a lot of hard work to be the leader and very few people want that. Always to grab for responsibility when it's offered and always to deliver more than is asked for. Number nine, and this is a long range comprehensive thing that needs to be checked regularly, but you don't ever quite get there. It's a rival at a personal code of standards. Those are standards in production, standards in behavior, and standards in morality. Number 10 is a familiarity with the master creations in music, in painting, in dance, in sculpture, in design, in architecture, in literature, in drama. To be at ease with the arts because apart from religion, the arts are the only way to transcend the animal materiality of our lives, to get in touch with a bigger you. Number 11 is the power of accurate observation and recording. I'll only give you one example of how you think this way, and if you push yourself, you will be able to supply many more. Power of accurate observation and recording. It used to be an axiom among the British upper classes that if you could not draw what you saw with your eye, then you, in fact, were not seeing what was there. So drawing wasn't a way to kill time, but a way to sharpen the perception. Charles Darwin, not my favorite human being, but nevertheless a major name in intellectual history over the past 150 years, if Charles Darwin had not been able to skillfully draw, then no one would have attended to his well-articulated theory of the evolution of the favored races. Look at the title of the book. It usually left out that part. But don't let me editorialize here. Modern science in some very great regard is only been possible through graphic representations, drawing and photography. Number 12 is the ability to deal with challenges of all sorts. Now this one's my favorite because one person's challenge is another person's ho-hum. To know what will challenge your son or your daughter, you have to know your son or daughter very, very well. If you have a kid who's painfully shy, obviously public presentations are the challenge that the kid needs as a corrective to uh, rather than live the rest of uh, their lives. If your 
child is a coward. That's a harsh word. But many people are natural cowards. Maybe all of us are natural cowards until we come to see that physical challenges really aren't so bad. And if they hurt, they don't hurt that much. Teach your kid if he gets knocked down always to stand back up. If he gets knocked down again, to stand back up again. That would be a challenge. But challenges are different for different people there. If you're used to eating garbage food at the fast food outlets, I guess it will be a challenge to train your palate to discriminate fresh food and excellence in preparation from, from a Big Mac. I guess I only picked that one because my wife is a superb cook and she graduated from the Culinary Institute in Hyde Park. See, Janet, I told you I wouldn't forget you. Uh, number 13, we're coming to the end of this, this curricular list, is a habit of caution in reasoning to conclusions. Should Iraq be invaded by the most technologically sophisticated military in the history of the planet, and should hundreds of billions of dollars be allotted to that purpose? Well, maybe it should and maybe it shouldn't. But listening to a few government propaganda hours about the similarities between the leader of Iraq and Adolf Hitler is not the way to come to the conclusion, even though it's the way that 80 or 90 percent of us do. And finally, is the constant development and testing of judgment. You make judgments, you discriminate value, and then you follow up. You keep an eye on your predictions to see how far skewed from what actually occurs, think, or, or how consistent with what transpires things are. Now, this might not be the totality of a great curriculum, but let me tell you from where I sit there, this is well worth considering long and hard as a diet for, for your own school practice. One of the great anomalies of the teaching business is the disconnect in awareness or the awareness disconnect between academic endeavor and the world of work, the job market. It's sort of implied that if you acquire a good academic record, that the world will take care of you later on, which I think is, is a very questionable assertion. Nevertheless, even if it were not a questionable assertion, I think you'll find what I'm going to say next interesting. I wrote to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I, I had read that they do projections about what jobs will be commonest in the economy of uh, a decade ahead. And I asked for the latest one of those. I said, well, what, what will be the most abundant jobs in the United States? And the list I got back will supply, I think, surprise you quite as much as it surprised me. The single commonest occupation in the United States will be retail salesperson, a clerk in a store. Now, quick, go over the 12 years of schooling that you probably had. Maybe add to it the four or six years of college you tacked on top of that. 
And tell me exactly what part of that experience is relevant to being a retail salesperson. Was your trigonometry or geometry or calculus, is that relevant? How about your memorizing the periodic table of elements? Is that men to laugh, David? Okay, the number two job in the United States will be registered nurse, which is kind of interesting. I've always felt in my own life that the nurse was far more important a part of the medical team than the doctors I encountered, present company accepted there. Uh, but once again, if you try to find a fit between the the diet, the scholastic diet, and what's required of a nurse, there's a there's a bit of a disconnect. The third most important job in the United States will be cashier. I don't need to comment on that. Number four is general office clerk, which speaks for itself. Number five is a job that's always intrigued me. I wish I had gone for it. It's truck driver. But once again, it's hard for me to see what the 12 years invested and the enormous amount of money uh, represented by that 12 years. In New York State, it's, it's about $11,000 a kid. I believe it's higher than that in California, but... It's certainly the equivalent, times 12. If we took that sum and invested it in kindergarten in the kid's name in some canny investments, maybe real estate, which has been a great investment, I think maybe when after 12 years it could be spent fishing or panning for gold, we could hand the kid a million bucks or so and say, now go get yourself an education somewhere. It's a gigantic part of the gross national product invested in this form of training. There has to be some reasonable theory of applicability to the functions that the national economy requires. The sixth most common job in the United States will be managers. The seventh, janitors, cleaners, and domestic servants. The eighth, nurses' aides, orderlies, and general attendants, ward attendants. The ninth, food counter and related workers. Notice we're not talking about chefs. We're talking about food counter workers. And tenth is the honorable profession that acting could not survive without wait persons. I would prefer to say waiters and waitresses. Now, when you look at that as the projected economy, is it any wonder that schools don't bother to teach writing or public speaking or higher order abstraction or any of a range of what would seem to be wonderfully useful things to learn or interesting things to learn. Because we don't want to upset the apple cart with our waiters and food counter workers or our truck drivers and cashiers. This is the reality of the economy we have. It's true that if you live in some protected enclaves in the United States, it doesn't seem to be the reality. It's a struggle between deciding to be an engineer or an agency head or or, or, or a doctor, a lawyer, but that isn't the reality for 95% of the country. 
I'd like to tell you now about the techniques I devised to try to break out of this trap, myself as well as the kids, how to break out of the trap of, of these conditioned responses, uh, this dependent thinking. And I had to work out, just for a moment, bear with me and think about my problem. I had 30 kids coming to me five times a day, but not the same 30 kids. So now there are 150 lives I impinge on for about 45 minutes a day. And then these kids, for no rational reason other than that the scheduler would go mad, I don't, go from, from science to gym or from studying history to studying poetry. And if you took the thread of these sequences and just set them down and tried to justify them on any other basis than administrative convenience, it would be impossible to do. The law says they have to be there six hours. You can kill 45 minutes of that time with lunch. You can kill another 20 minutes of that time changing classes. Now you've still got about five hours. And what are you going to do with it? The way we judge each other in the school business is whether it looks like we're doing something worthwhile with it. That means that the kids are in their seat or wiggling their hands in the air or copying notes off a board. Absolutely no one anywhere has any idea whether the quality is transpiring in that time. If you wear a three-piece blue pinstripe suit and a nice chalet tie, you just automatically assume to be in league with the professoriate or, or something. Uh, anyway, I had to figure out why. First, I had to figure out what exact forces or pretty exact forces were causing these reams of pathological behavior I was seeing. And that doesn't always mean swinging from the chandelier. It could mean falling asleep, which probably is the same thing to do. But not falling asleep in such a way that the, that the leader of the class sees you because that's such, such a gruesome insult that usually vengeance is, is called for there. So how was I going to get the kids to develop independent characters and sound characters and independent minds? So I began to work with the mechanical possibilities. One of the first things I did, I hypothesized that the arrangement in long lines and rows, ranks and files, might very well have a, a bad effect on the energy in the people so ranked and filed. Uh, we've all had the experience of sitting around in a circle, and that does seem to release different energies. But I began to experiment with the variety of ways that I could arrange the classroom furniture so as to produce, hopefully, a different kind of psychic result, that the kids would be more into things, that they'd be broken away from their uh, mental fantasies of, of a Big Mac or McDonald's or the porno on the Internet. And, and could join in the collective consideration of an idea there. And I came up with about 12, which I won't bore you 
with going through one, two, three, four, five. If you just take 30 little squares of paper and you put it in a confined rectangle, you could get some of the ideas right away and eventually you'd come up with all the ones I did and more. But those would include simply stacking all the furniture in the back of the room and not allowing its use so that you had to crawl or lay on the floor or sit on the floor. And so, so that did in fact produce, since I, since I changed the furniture every single day, that was when I was young and strong, I changed it every single day, I found that in a very short time, several weeks, there, the classes were coming into my room and they were absolutely expecting, they were more alive and alert than I had ever experienced in my own time. So now what I'm after is some different ways to provoke these responses that are less efforty than moving the furniture every... The, the first thing I saw as an enemy of, of mental alertness was that we have fixed time, fixed space, fixed sequencing, fixed text to work from. And I decided to make the time, the space, the sequences, and the text completely variable on an individual basis, but you had to negotiate with me for it. So a kid could come in who spent all his time drawing comic books in my room, but being pretty discreet about it there. He could come in and say, I want one day a week to go to the public library at a time when no other kids are there during the school day, sit in the art section, take down all the resources on graphic art, and put myself to a high-level program of learning perspective and the dynamics of uh, coloring and so on, of, of graphic arts. He would have changed the sequencing, the space, the time, and the text selection of his school day. And that was one of the projects that I allowed. I had a standing offer that anyone who wanted to who was deeply engaged in a piece of work in my room, that I would find space for them, if they chose, to continue that on that work until it was finished or until they were much further along, rather than being picked up at the sound of a bell and dropped in a gym class or an art class or a science class or any other class at all, that they could finish what they started. So. That was one of the methods that with great success and a lot of political maneuvering that I introduced into my classes. Uh, another thing, another thing that I inserted about midway in my teaching career is that I would create a project, but I would disperse my kids anywhere in New York City that they chose to go in order to complete that project. If you're a fan of Peter Drucker's management books, this would be Drucker's invention of managing by objectives. The executive selects the goal to be uh, approached and reached but he does not survey any of the methods at all. He simply says, today we're here, tomorrow we want to be there, get there any way that you can. So some of those things, to give you some examples, one that was outrageously uh, successful was, recall that my kids were 13 years old, and I said, 
in five years, which is 1,825 days, some of you go off to college and some of you go off to a job, but all of you are going to have to find a place to live unless you want to hang out at home, which not many of you will want to do. So you're going to get an empty space and you're going to have to convert it very quickly all by yourself with no prior experience into some reasonable approximation of a home so that you won't be ashamed to have friends in or a girlfriend over for dinner or whatever. So what you need to do is not only find out what the the objects required for, for that are, the, the, the functional ones and then the ones that you would add to realize your personality. But you're going to have to find out approximately what their prices are going to be. Then you're going to total the amount of that and you're going to find yourself facing a whopping bill that very few of you could conceivably hope to reach. But rather than me telling you what it is, Go anywhere in New York City, I'm going to give you a two-and-a-half-room apartment, and you'll be lucky in New York City to get a two-and-a-half-room apartment. You're probably talking at the cheapest $1,500 a month rent and probably more like $2,000 a month rent. Well, that's $24,000 a year. To get $24,000 after taxes, you have to make I don't know, 32000 And then, of course, you have to eat and clothe yourself and get around. So these project-based uh, assignments led to very complex personal decisions, and they also led to a... To a a very commonsensical, useful project. In this case, each kid would have a floor plan of an apartment, and I made it as, uh, as realistic as possible by cutting floor plans of apartments out of uh, uh, the Sunday newspaper real estate sections, and then I would ask them to construct little colored uh, paste-ons for chairs for sofas or for whatever else they wanted in the apartment, and they were to submit that to me with an itemized bill and a total sum, including sales tax, that they would require. What we quickly were able to come to the conclusion is that in most of my classes, nobody could do that. I then said, but you will have to do something like that, so you're going to have to be resourceful and figure out how the millions of people turned loose on the work market every year manage to do that. It's true some stay at home for a few years, and it's true that some get a helping hand from their parents, but it's also true that a whole lot of people can't get help from their parents because the help is impossible. So what are some of the other solutions? Teaming up so that three people share the same space cuts the costs considerably for each individual. That's certainly one thing. Improvising the furnishings or scavenging discarded but still useful things from not just from dumpsters but from people who constantly in a commercial economy like this one are ridding themselves of perfectly useful furnishings, air conditioners, you name it, someone is throwing it away at any given time or virtually throwing it away by selling it for pennies on the dollar, and there are regular sales organs. Now some of them are on the Internet, but there are regular paper sales organs that collect these things. 
As I was driving up to David's today, I passed three lawn sales. And I quickly spotted, if I weren't 3,000 miles away, a couple of pieces of furniture that I'll bet I could have walked away for 10 or 20 bucks with that I would be happy to have back in in New York. It's just that the airplane might not be happy to provide carriage for it. There are other projects besides this that were really outrageously successful. Uh, one of them was, this was a private one, was analyzing the characteristics of publicly accessible swimming pools. I had a girl who had, was interested in nothing except becoming an Olympic swimmer. Nothing at all. She had no interest in any schoolwork at all. But I said, what are the best public pools in New York City? The five boroughs. I mean, it's 300 square miles. And she said she didn't know. And I said, well, as a swimmer, how would you determine whether a pool was excellent or good or mediocre or bad? And what are the characteristics you'd spot? And she was able to name six or seven of them. And I said, well, suppose you take this checklist that you created and you spend the next couple of months going from swimming pool to swimming pool creating a consumer's guide to public swimming pools in New York City. I said, I would, I would be certain that there would be local magazines interested in paying you to print that maybe even a little guide that could be sold on on bookstalls there. So that was outrageously successful for one person. Uh, one of the things that everyone liked to do was to shadow either their father or their mother or occasionally an uncle or a an older brother or sister, at work. Shadowing means you don't say anything. You travel around with that person and you log exactly what that person is doing. Made 10 phone calls between 9 a.m. and noon. Spent an average of three minutes, shortest 30 seconds, longest eight minutes. You log everything the person does in their job, and then at lunchtime or after work, you say, I saw you do this. What did this mean? I saw you talk to this person in that office, and you were visibly nervous. Why was that? I learned how to do shadowing from going to the the Department of Labor's two-volume job dictionary, which is in every public library in the United States, and either in the front or the back. It's been so many years, I don't remember. There are pages and pages on how these job descriptions are created. The job dictionary will list every job that you can conceivably imagine and its performance characteristics it's access. It's the kind of book that libraries buy and probably no one ever reads, you know, to their, uh, to their loss, I think. But I wasn't interested in the jobs. I was interested in the methodology because I knew I could then sell that as highly professional uh, research work. And we did that. We created a talking job dictionary every year. There were about five years when my interest was high enough to do this project. A talking job dictionary that we then donated to uh, homes for blind kids. And they could hear, you know, Billy Bowman talking about the, the job of being a fireman, what its challenges were what its low points were, what its income cycle was, what you needed to offer as preparation to be able to compete for the job. I think it was 
a marvelous project. Obviously, it could be done anywhere. I never found a kid who wasn't completely absorbed in shadowing. And then, if you recall, when we talked about private schools, we talked about methods of access. It's a natural dovetail that if you decide you want to shadow a news anchor at a news network, how do you get access to that person? And how, if you decide you want to shadow a news anchor at a news network, how do you get access to that person? And how do you convince them to allow you to spend a day in the station there? I'm thinking of one of our most famous shadowing episodes. Uh, a woman named Sue Simmons, I'm going back about 15 years now, maybe 17 or 18, uh, was the hottest news anchor in New York City. She'd come from Atlanta, I believe, and she started out at five or six million dollars a year, and and everybody was dazzled by Sue Simmons there. And one girl came to me and said, you wanted to shadow Sue Simmons? I said, <laughs> I said, Boy, there's a tough one, because if you write the network, Sue Simmons will never see the letter. You get a form letter back saying, we'd love to help you, but it's impossible given the blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, I said, if you can penetrate her personal security, if you can find out where she lives and make a personal appeal and offer her a quid pro quo, something for something, I said, you have a chance that she just might do this for you. Now, you can tell, I think, from my manner that, in fact, she succeeded, but not the intermediary steps, which took three months of hounding that poor woman and baking brownies for her and leaving notes at her building every other day until finally Sue must have thought, the easiest way to defend myself against this girl is simply to do it. And when it happened, I said to the girl, now you've got to make good on the quid pro quo. I told the girl if she took uh, a still camera and she took slides of the newsroom and, and a day with Sue Simmons in the newsroom, and then she made a, a tape recording text that would coordinate with the slides. The duplicating slides is very cheap. In those days, it was, I think, a dime a slide. So if she it took a 36 uh, image roll of 35 millimeter film, for 350 we could get a dupe set of the slides. And then a cassette tape was a buck. You know, and you could donate a day with Sue Simmons to every school in the school district. There were 20 of them, so your total expenditure on that thing is about 100 bucks. And what you've done is give each of the schools in the district the chance to have a day with Sue Simmons to see the inside workings of the NBC newsroom. And you could also write a couple of pages on how you got access to this opportunity, Sue Simmons' name would be bandied about the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which is the media bedroom for the television industry. She could only come out of it smelling like roses. She had helped a 13-year-old public school kid. I have no doubt that some newspaper or other would have done a little feature article on it. So there would have been a real quid pro quo here. And indeed, all, all those things happen. But it, it, it gives your life a kind of a, a treasure hunt aspect. It's amazingly exhilarating. You're constantly looking at the world you live in and saying, how could I create a way for a kid to penetrate that reality and produce a worthwhile project that would have interest beyond his or her own life and might really resonate down the years. So that's one of the things I did. Field curriculum, I called that. Uh, 
I realized that the lack of responsibility in these kids' lives was leading to a lot of the pathologies that, that I saw. To, to not to be useful is to be useless. That's not just a play on words. It's true. You either have a function or you don't. You either have a function that, that's real or you have a phony function copying notes off a blackboard or pretending that embedding yourself in this institution for 12 years is the only and best way you can develop your mind. That's nonsense, and we all know that. Uh, so I looked for ways to bring this about. The next thing I uh, and, and the way I discovered was apprenticeships. I rediscovered the wheel what had been the staple of Western education, and probably Eastern too, for that matter, for millennia, apprenticing yourself to somebody who knows how to do something. Now, certainly I didn't have the power or the inclination to assign a kid for a year, but to assign a kid one day a week for a year, which adds up to 40 days out of the school year, or eight school weeks, I thought was a fair exchange. And for those kids who were too emotionally inadequate to do that, I conceived of the one, two, or three-day apprenticeship where someone would take the kid in and let the kid see what the nature of that, whatever that, that business or specialty was, and uh, explain to the kid how decisions were made in exchange for some service. I would tell the kids, if you just take and go away, you're not only a nasty human being there, this really won't stick with you. You always have to come to somebody with a quid pro quo in mind and say, if you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. And of course, kids will always say to you, kids can't do anything. But in fact, there are many things they can do, among which I'd say the principal value is just to ask penetrating questions of an older person. Because all of us like to lay our lives out in the air so that other people can live schematically what we went through. Everyone loves to do that. It defines us. Uh, the next thing I did, but only for a few kids, maybe five a year, because it's much more difficult than an apprenticeship, you'll find that getting a short-term apprenticeship is very, very easy to do, much easier than you imagine. Uh, but getting a mentorship where there's a, uh, like a family exchange like someone steps in as a, a godfather or something, and for regular times each week, there's an intense personal relationship. Uh, these are much, much harder because the person committing to them will be aware that this isn't just something I can do with my left hand. Like to get an apprenticeship with an auto mechanic, you know, basically it's, it's just... A, to, to let the kid lean over the hood and see all these wonderful things being manipulated. And then the guy says, and this is this, and, and then you go on. But to open yourself the way a mentorship, uh, cost, but it's worth trying because those are transformational experiences. Uh, then we did whole class projects. I said, what could 30 kids or 150 kids in some cases, what could they accomplish in one or two or three days that would make a permanent change or, or a visible change for, for the better in the life of this city? Notice here what we're really talking about is a sine qua non of citizenship. You have to take an active role in the community 
That's what defines a citizen. So some of those were turning vacant lots into gardens. That's an old classic, and it never wears out. Uh, putting on shows or plays or variety shows for old age homes and for children's wards in hospitals and for veterans' wards at veterans' hospitals. The, the real trick is finding an audience. Kids are natural performers. They're natural hams. They love to do it, and they learn a great deal about ensemble work, about how to make your part uh, integrate with everyone else's part, including the lighting person and the costume person, the direction. Those are wonderful things to do. I would at any given time have two variety show teams traveling through New York City and anything, banks, other schools, old age homes, were grist for, for our mill. Because any audience works for a set of performers who need to be immune to the audience, don't they? I mean, they can't say, oh, I don't want to play before. Those people, whoever buys a ticket is the audience. Can't predict that. But you do need an audience or you can't really grow beyond uh, uh, a preliminary point in learning this wonderful magical skill of becoming somebody else. There. Uh, so we started a food co-op every year. We found out where the wholesale market was. There will be one in, uh, wait a minute, I'm in Pasadena. There's a wholesale market around here somewhere where all the restaurants and food markets go early in the morning, like 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. or 2 a.m., and they buy whatever they're going to use in their work wholesale, and they bring it back. The people selling that stuff don't care who they sell it to. And for, with a few exceptions, they don't have one price for Team A and one price for Team B. These trucks come in and out of the city all night long. And somewhere around here is the wholesale market. Find out where it is. Take your kid there. Buy a quantity that'll set up a little stand. And the way we did it was we took orders through all the classes in the school ahead of time. And then what was left over, we set out on the, the main desk in the front office at 3 o'clock. Let me tell you, there was never anything left ever, not one piece left. Most of the stuff was pre-sold, pre of course, because you can offer people about a 20% break on their food uh, raw materials and it's much fresher than than if you pick it up through uh, through a food market because they they uh, cold storage a lot of the food the bigger ones will cold storage it for nine weeks before they sell it to you as fresh uh, I insisted on substantial community service one day a week. And that almost invariably was a loan. In some of these applications, you do not want a culture of children traveling together because then the experience is muted severely by the, the protective insulation that running around with a group of friends do. So so I did the bookings at first, but I said you can always book yourself and replace the placement that I, I got for you. So my kids one day a week would be scattered all over the 300 square miles of New York City. And if you say, wasn't that dangerous, didn't have a couldn't hold a hair to how dangerous it was just to be in the, the school. Uh, and in 20 years of doing this, we didn't have 
a single incident, even though many of the placements and distances my kids traveled, I think you might think were reckless. I always cleared these things with the mothers ahead of time, but I didn't bother even to inform the school administration. Uh, parent partnerships on school time. Now, if you're homeschooling and you're watching this, uh, this is what you do all the time. But in the position I was in, I saw that the institution of forced schooling had as one of its logics that you would weaken the connection between the student and their family. So I tried to create a, a, a remedy for that. I said, you can always book yourself out of all your school classes for a day or two by drawing up a partnership with your mother or your father or your grandfather and setting out to explore some part of the city and to produce some understanding or or some service or whatever. What you have to do is design an application and I'll be as fair as I know how to be. If it looks to me that that was the equivalent or more of what I would have asked and expected from you in the days you were there, off you'll go. And I said, as a byproduct, you'll get to actually know your mother as a human being rather than as someone who makes breakfast in the morning you don't see again until evening. Uh, I had a standing arrangement that you could always exchange school time for starting a small business. And if you think there aren't a number of small businesses that kids have an advantage over older people in, then you're quite mistaken. They don't pay rent or upkeep. They can offer many services that are essential and substantially undercut professionals offering the same service. Think only of, well, Los Angeles is a, uh, is a city of homes, I guess. But New York City is a city of apartment buildings where you'll have 75 or more families living in one vertical unit. Now imagine that you have to move out of one of those places. Not easy to do. There's virtually no parking at all in, in a substantial part of the city without risking instantly being towed from the spot. And secondarily, the city's a bedroom community for many old people without families and often from spouses without their opposite gender number. If you're a 75-year-old woman and you want to move from the 14th floor to the third floor, you have an expensive proposition on your hands. But let me tell you, a team of 13-year-old kids can do the work three times as fast as a professional team, and you can pay them uh, a fair amount, but that fair amount will be a tiny fraction of what you'd pay. Now, here's a service that's utterly necessary, probably thousands of times a week all over New York City, and people grieve when they can't meet the terms of that service. Here's a a wonderful business that schools could encourage. How about pet sitting? What do you do in New York City with your goldfish when you're going away for three weeks? How about your dog? How about if you're going to be in the hospital for two weeks? Does everybody, as they do on sitcoms, on television, have a friend they can call and say, take the dog? I guarantee you, no. That isn't true, and many people would feel leery about asking a friend to do that service or frightened. Uh, I first learned about the possibilities in 
of kids and, and, and work as a substitute for curriculum, when back in 1968, I learned of a 13-year-old boy who was making $26,000 a year walking dogs, except he never touched a dog. He booked the dog walking. He hired school kids to do the dog walking. He trained them how to walk two or three dogs at the same time with one of those little appliances. And he took, I think, 50 cents a dog. At the time, his father was a postal clerk, I think making $15,000 a year. Remember, it's 1968, it's 35 years ago. And his mother had some other low paid income. His name was Brian Bantry. And he became a Broadway producer with his, his capital that he accumulated. Oh my. Uh, there's just a few more of these. These are, a menu of methods that can be substituted for standard academic curriculum, but most of which, in fact, the standard academic curriculum can sit right on top of. You don't have to be mutually exclusive when you do these things. Uh, experiences with solitude. I knew from reading and from my own life, that without the ability to be alone by yourself, that you're in for uh, quite a substantial amount of grief in your life if you don't learn to appreciate your own company. But you're also missing, I think, one of the developmental steps in having a reflective mind because the answers that come quickly or the answers that come to you through brainstorming with other people are not always, but most always, exceedingly shallow takes on whatever the question at hand is. You know, they may seem satisfying as they happen, but as you try to apply them, they're very often unsatisfactory. So you have to put yourself through, I don't think I'm telling most of you something you don't already know, you have to put yourself through a kind of an apprenticeship of solitude to break out of the box, to break out of ordinary thinking, even if it's high level ordinary thinking. It's a trap. Uh, but how to trick children, and that I, I have to admit, how to trick children into doing something that I knew they needed to have practice with. Well, here are some of the ways. There is a reservoir system around New York City that goes from, oh, 10 or 15 miles away from the city to really 150 miles from the city that supplies the water through an elaborate system of aqueducts and tunnels. And all of those reservoirs are wonderful places to fish because no one fishes there. You can get a permit from, from the city of New York. I don't think it costs anything. And you can fish in any of these reservoirs. I had a standing offer that anybody could take the day off and go fishing if they went alone and that I had maps on the walls of where to go and another day to get down to City Hall and get a permit to go fishing. When I used to do that, it was uh, just pro forma. You know, you filled out some form and they handed you a permit to fish in the reservoirs. Uh, huge fish because of the, nobody fishes there. Uh, and the reservoirs around New York City are are enormous. I mean, there'll be 5,000 acre lakes and impoundments that are 10, 15, 20 miles long. So, so they're real lakes. That's one way. Uh, taking a hike. You want to get out to City Hall and try to get in and see the mayor or just watch the city council, which is a slam dunk. Uh, you can just do that 
okay with me. You got to walk from my school to uh, City Hall was about 10 miles. If that seems like an inordinately long walk to you, then welcome, I guess, to the 20th and 21st century. That would be a jaunt historically for people who wanted to get around. We've lost the use of our legs, and, and we've certainly lost, I think, the confidence that if you just put one foot in front of another, sooner or later you'd be in California. And not that much later. Uh, so that's another uh, way I arrange solitude. You could always go anywhere in the city and map a future uh, place that someone might want to visit. You could go to the court area and map the location of the courts and the entrances and so on. Or you could go up to Columbia University and create a map of of that campus that a kid could use with a little bit of acting ability to just walk on and live as a college student. We never got picked up doing that, and there must not have been a day when some of my kids weren't sitting in on law school lectures. They're all 13. Did they have any trouble passing as 19 or 20? No. I just told them, don't ever smile. Use a clipboard instead of a notebook and strike arrogant poses. I said, you'll pass the college student. Uh, the last three things I kept as colors on the palette, uh, or the last two, were utterly independent study. Not where I participated in the creation of, uh, of, uh, a menu of alternatives, but where the kid from start to finish conceived the expedition and conceived the way to judge it. Uh, and finally, experience in how to kill time. I call it improvisational play. You got three hours to wait for your job interview. You're out on the winter beach at Coney Island. There's nobody else there, but there are waves, there are birds, there's sand as far as the eye can see and no people. You know, how do you fill these these bits of time? Because you're always afraid of, you see this as a cousin to solitude. If you're always afraid of uh, of, of doing these things by yourself, then you become lifelong dependent. You're one of those people who can't be seen on the street without a cell phone. And I would cheerfully murder you if I thought I could get away with it. Okay, those are the 12 action themes of what I call the guerrilla curriculum. If you would like to operate as a guerrilla inside the, or underneath the radar of, uh, of the government system. These are 12 ways to do it. Over the 11 years since I retired from school teaching, this will be, we're into the 12th, I had to find a way to distill the lessons that 30 years of classroom school teaching taught me. And for one of something better to do, I began writing books and going on an endless lecture tour, which has really taken me around the world, but it's taken me into every corner of the United States. Uh, the books that I've written during that time are all still in print, and they're available at my website which I believe I told you was my name with the three W's and dot com, or they're actually available from Barnes & Noble, but I'll sign them if you order them from the website. Basis. The second requirement of these schools is that every graduate have a strong experience 
with the act of literacy. Now, we're all familiar with literacy as some exercise in reading, but the act of literacies are writing and public speaking. No matter how well developed your mind becomes on strong texts, it's useless to convince anyone else of your point of view unless you can write well and you can speak well. I think we've come to this juncture in history believing that that's some God-given gift that only a few people have. I can guarantee you, as a school teacher for 30 years, that both of those skills are extremely easy to teach. To teach public speaking, you simply have to offer regular opportunities to speak before a group of strangers. That could be a group as small as one, two, or three, or it could be an auditorium full of strangers. But the fact that they're not people that you feel comfortable with, I think, is essential. To write well, it requires nothing more than that you write constantly and regularly, every day, preferably. The improvement will occur quite naturally. At that point, you might be able to profitably use some expert intervention, but in the process of reaching competency, intervention is the worst possible thing, simply the practice of doing it. So now we have a finalist for the presidency, attended schools that only graduate a thousand a year. So I thought there might be some real utility in finding out what these schools teach as opposed to what public schools teach. And that job proved to be much easier than I thought. So I'd like to share with you the 14 principles that I discovered that are universal among these schools. Even though each is quite a different animal than the next, they all concentrate on these 14 themes. The first of these themes is that no could kid should graduate without a theory of human nature. What makes people tick? What buttons do you press to get the results from your fellow man and woman that you want? And where does the fund of lore come from? Not from psychology, not even in a small way. The fund of lore about human nature comes from history, philosophy, theology, that's a curse word, isn't it, in public schooling, literature, and law. These five mighty agencies of human history and the human mind have a wealth of information about what human beings are like now, have been like, and probably always will be like. And every kid is expected to have a degree of expertise drawn from these sources. I guess I should say these data in the media and say, in this time of trouble, dissent is not wanted, are truly un-American because this country was the world's first laboratory of dissent on the part of everybody. That's really what the American dream is largely composed of, the ability to speak your mind in a public forum. So that kind of understanding, which is, is kept under close wraps, in public schooling is examined minutely in these elite private boarding schools. There are many, many other uh, working engines of our institutions that we're not allowed to understand. I might contradict myself and give you one more. 
the military, which is quite an expensive institution to maintain, even in times of peace, is always constituted at the fraction of one to one and a half percent of the entire adult male population. Never heard that before. That was a rule or a principle worked out in Prussian Germany several hundred years ago. Now your homework is to find out why that fraction, but I'll give you a clue. The prison population of the United States is very close to the military population of the United States, and that fraction, too, was worked out in Prussian Germany about 200 years ago. So you should expect the teacher's theory of human nature and skill in the act of literacies. Number three, uh, among the curriculum themes that unite these elite private boarding schools, is insight into the major institutional forms, like our courts or our corporations or our military, including details of the ideas which drive them. I'll only give you one sample of this so you can see how how seriously uh, government schools fall short of the mark in offering insight into these institutions. Uh, we have all heard endlessly in schools of separation of powers, that the governance of the United States is divided into at least three compartments, one an executive compartment, one a legislative compartment, that further divided into two compartments of its own, and finally a judicial department. Now, a little bit of reflection should show you what the purpose of that is. Not that we all live in harmony and agree in times of trouble with what to say and do, but exactly the opposite of that. That the only possible way to arrive at an approximation of truth is through argument. The more skillful the argument on all sides, the better for the, the ultimate result of truth so that people who appear before you... Hello, I'm John Gatto, and I travel by the name John Taylor Gatto for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Uh, I was a New York City public school teacher for 30 years, and I resigned from school teaching on the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal in 1991, and since that time I've traveled one and a half million miles in all 50 states and eight foreign countries trying to arrest the career of the institution of government schooling. One of the really useful pieces of research that I've engaged in for the past 11 or 12 years is studying the 18 or 20 elite private boarding schools that set the tone for approximately 300 such schools and produce a substantial chunk of our national leadership. I don't think there are many people aware of the fact that in the 2000 presidential election that four of the six finalists for the presidency went to one or another of these schools. George Bush went to Andover. Uh, John McCain went to Episcopal High. Steve Forbes went to Brook. And Al Gore, I think Gore went to St. Andrews, but if you'll let me look at my note, uh, St. Albans in Washington, D.C. Uh, these schools only graduate 
about a thousand kids a year. This is a nation of 300 million, and yet four of the six 